Accelerating Development by Proper Error Handling and Reporting, a presentation about fail-first system design. My name is Keith Swenson. I'm a DMN expert with the Decisioning as a Service team, and I'm here today to talk about error messages. For most people, talking about error messages is a little like talking about dirty laundry. We just wish they didn't exist. They're somewhat of an embarrassment, and as if in a perfect world, they would never exist. So let's just try to get rid of them, but I'm here to say the opposite. Error messages could be the key to productivity and the key to excellence in software design if you know how to use them correctly. Fail for a system design is where in any project the first thing you code is an error handler. And at the very rootmost level, it catches all exceptions, it reliably logs them, and it delivers it suitably back to the caller. Either as a pop-up dialog in a user interface or as a return message in a web API or perhaps printing to the screen in a command line prompt. But first we need to understand why are there errors? Why would a user send an improper request to a server or to a library or to a component? Would they do this on purpose? And of course the answer is no, they wouldn't. A bad request was made because the caller didn't know it was bad. I mean, what's the point in making a call that you're going to get an error? If they knew it was an improper request, they wouldn't have made it. And that's why there's an opportunity here for the error message to fill the gap of knowledge to explain what the system is going to do on a particular kind of request. Now here's a collection of poor error messages I've seen in the past. These messages are poor because they do not explain what you did wrong and they do not help you find a better solution. And I see these all over the place in all sorts of systems. A good error message on the other hand saves the time of the user uh, who doesn't need to search through the documentation. It saves the time of the support staff, the administrators, the developers. It also increases the chance that the user will learn to use the system and it makes the system more successful overall. Now how you create a good error message from a complicated system with multiple levels of detail is too complicated for this presentation. But what I can say is that if you only send the most detailed information about what actually caused the stop of the processing, it's almost impossible to, for the user to know why it was doing that and what relevance there is to the call they originally made. What I will argue is that the best error message is one that includes not only the specific detail that stopped the execution, but also the context for that. Why was it doing that particular thing at that time? And if you return all of this, all five of these messages, as an error, the user will have in their hands something to understand why it went wrong and to understand how to improve it, make it better. To do this, we break the code into two sections. One section is where the normal program logic goes, but the other section is where the exceptional code. Here is a depiction of a happy path, standard programming. You have a method that calls another method and calls another method and it returns back to the call point. The thing to note here is that the exception handling code, the red bars, are not executed at all. They are completely left out of the processing. So this processing can be as quick and efficient as you need it to be. Notice that if something goes wrong, you have a completely separate return path. And in that return path, you can construct a well-conceived error message which explains what the program was doing and what went wrong. Here's how that development pattern is implemented in Java. You have, for the normal code, a big try block. But then you have a catch block that catches everything. And it adds to that. It wraps that exception with more information about what was going on at the time and it throws that. I'd like to caution you, it's a bad practice to return data with an exception. You should never use exception handling to return program logic data to a caller, but we are not doing that here. What we're using the exception for is to return metadata about how the program failed to do what it was asked to do. Because you can count on the logging at the 
rootmost level and the display at the rootmost level, you don't need to spread a lot of log statements through the code. You can count on it being done at the end, makes it easy to throw an exception from any point in the code and be assured that the user will receive it. Here's some guidelines that have been in the rules lab for a long time, and that is, includes being specific with relevant details around the problem that was encountered. It speaks in the language of the user, and it's aimed at showing how the user exactly what went wrong, so that if the user needs to change the request, they have what they need without having to call for additional support. Here's some more examples. Don't say you don't have access rights, but say user XYZ doesn't have access rights. Or mention the actual file or the actual parameter that was found to be invalid. And if the request is too large, mention what it means to be too large. The bulk of the benefit will come to your own team because while developers are developing within the team, they will be making requests which are not exactly right. And if you get an error message back that tells you precisely what went wrong, you can immediately make a correction instead of having to spend time debugging it to try to figure out what it was that went wrong. So in summary, this approach of failure first design, you start by expecting a good error message. You use the error code path to build a message that's meaningful, which is then reliably delivered with low overhead and the benefits are that you spend less time supporting users and more time enhancing functionality. Thank you very much.